This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Last month, in the United States, we observed Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Every year in October, marches, summits, conferences, and other events are held to inform, educate, and bring awareness to domestic violence, or what is also now known as intimate partner violence. The first Domestic Violence Awareness Month was observed in October 1987. It was less than a dozen years before that that this kind of violence was considered at all. Before then, it was labeled by most Americans, law enforcement and courts as well, as a family issue and nobody else's business. As a matter of fact, violence against one's wife, in particular, had a long history of being condoned by society. In 1800 BC, the Code of Hammurabi decreed that a wife was subservient to her husband and that he could inflict punishment on any member of his household for any transgression. The Roman Code of Paterfamilias reads, If you should discover your wife in adultery, you may with impunity put her to death without a trial. But if you should commit adultery or indecency, she must not presume to lay a finger on you, nor does the law allow it. French law in the 1600s had a law written to protect wives that read, All the inhabitants have the right to beat their wives so long as death does not follow. That was considered progress at the time. Sometime in the 1700s, English common law came into effect that decreed that a husband had the right to, quote, chastise his wife with a whip or a rattan no bigger than his thumb in order to enforce domestic discipline. This law came to be known as the rule of thumb. Alabama became the first state in the Union to outlaw wife beating in 1871. But in 1910, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a wife had no cause for action on an assault and battery charge against her husband because it, quote, would open the doors of the courts to accusations of all sorts of one spouse against the other and bring into public notice complaints for assault, slander, and libel, thus making the laws useless. As recently as 1977, the California Penal Code stated that wives charging husbands with criminal assault and battery must suffer more injuries than commonly needed for charges of other kinds of battery. This attitude permeated the culture that made violence against women by their partners seen as less serious than any other type of violent crime. So what caused our views to change and spurred victims to speak out and be heard about domestic violence? Like many modern problems, awareness grew out of a media event. Like the O.J. Simpson trial highlighting the ins and outs of the American justice system, or Caitlyn Jenner's journey as a transgendered person being aired weekly on reality television, when millions tune in to watch, awareness grows. On the evening of April 8, 1984, over one-third of American televisions were tuned into NBC to watch a made-for-television movie titled The Burning Bed. The movie detailed the true-life story of Francine Hughes and showed in brutal detail the violence she experienced for over a dozen years in her own home at the hands of her husband, Mickey. Francine was played by Farrah Fawcett, a Hollywood actress best known for her role on the hit television show Charlie's Angels, from 1976 to 1980. Before the movie aired, domestic violence was a taboo subject that was rarely mentioned in public and certainly had never been shown so accurately on television before. The ugly secret of domestic violence was exposed, a secret that was all too common. Today, nationally, according to the National Coalition of Domestic Violence, one in three women and one in four men have been victims of some form of physical violence by an intimate partner, and one in five women and one in seven men have been victims of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. After The Burning Bed aired, women all over the country realized they were not alone. Join me for Chapter 2 of True Crime Game Changers as I share a story that forced us to take a hard look at violence in the home and make changes in legislation to protect victims of intimate partner violence. This is Chapter 2, Francine Hughes and The Burning Bed. Francine Moran was one of six children born to Walter Moran and Hazel Fleming Moran. Walter and Hazel, originally from Kentucky, married in 1938. 
Walter was 25 and Hazel was 14. They moved north to Lansing, Michigan to find work, first working on farms and later Hazel worked as a waitress. When Walter found a job working in a factory, the family relocated to Jackson, moving from house to house when they got behind on the rent. Walter was a hard worker, but a weekend drinker. He would begin drinking on Friday, payday, and sometimes Hazel would have to intercept him and take his paycheck before he drank most of it away. He also began to gamble and was arrested and spent a short time in jail for stealing tools from the shop where he worked to repay gambling debts. Francine's mother worked, raised six kids, and kept an immaculate home. From her, Francine learned that home and family were a woman's top priority. Sometimes times were tough, but you didn't complain. You just bore the weight and kept going. Francine learned to cook and keep a clean home. You might not have much, her mother emphasized, but you should keep it nice and take pride in what you did have. Francine, being the second oldest daughter, was also often charged with caring for the younger children. One day, three-year-old David wandered off down the road without Francine noticing, and he was hit by a car. He was badly injured but survived. Francine, only eight at the time, always felt a tremendous amount of guilt for what she considered to be her fault. She nursed him around the clock, making sure he had everything he needed. Francine was a bright child and loved school. Her parents had very little schooling. Her mother had only had one year and could not read or write until her husband taught her. Francine, in contrast, was her class's champion speller and earned high marks in most subjects. She was proud of her good grades and loved to read. As she got older and had more responsibilities at home, however, school seemed to fade into the background. It didn't seem related to real life to Francine, which was all about chores and caring for her siblings, making sure everyone was fed and cared for. She felt more mature than her classmates and like she didn't fit in. This feeling was exacerbated when she began junior high school and the girls were more interested in looks and clothing. Francine felt the stigma of poverty and felt self-conscious and less than than the other girls in her class. Francine's only currency was her intelligence, which was scorned by her peers. Only popularity mattered. She had less and less incentive to do well in school. Francine met a girl named Sharon Taylor, whose circumstances were similar to her own. Their fathers both worked in factories, and Sharon lived a block over in a similar home. They became best friends. Francine, now 15, was interested in all things other teens did at that time, hanging out with friends at parties, playing records, going out with groups to drive around and meet and flirt with boys. Francine was inexperienced in boy-girl relations, growing up in a very conservative home with strict parents. She was taller than most of the other girls, five foot seven, with a curvy figure that embarrassed her, but got her noticed by boys. Sharon and Francine met two boys, Bill Hensley and Mickey Hughes, at a friend's house. Sharon was attracted to Bill, and when Bill and Mickey offered them a ride home, the girls jumped at the chance to get to know them. Mickey was 18 and seemed more mature than the other boys, which made him attractive to Francine. On the way home, Mickey parked the car and tried to kiss Francine. She resisted and struggled with him for several minutes before he gave up and, disgusted, dropped her home. Sharon and Francine both agreed that Mickey and Bill, who'd also been too fresh, were creeps. Later that spring, Francine ran into Mickey again, and he asked her out for the following weekend. Francine, not having had many real dates before, agreed. Francine began seeing Mickey regularly, and Sharon began dating Bill at the same time. Their dates were usually the boys picking up Francine and Sharon, going to McDonald's for hamburgers, driving around, and then making out in the car before being dropped off at home. Mickey, having left school at 16, had a full-time job in a car, which made him seem rich to Francine. Mickey took Francine to meet his parents who lived in Dansville, 30 minutes away from Jackson. Mickey's mom, Flossie, was tall and seemed to rule the home over her husband, Berlin, who was shorter than his wife and quiet. Flossie was outspoken, speaking in a plain, no-nonsense Kentucky Mountain folk way that was familiar to Francine. Francine continued to date Mickey into the summer, and Mickey began to press her to take the relationship further physically. Francine was flattered by all Mickey's attention to her. He seemed to never be able to see her enough, and even told her that he loved her. But her own feelings were somewhat more ambivalent. She didn't feel in love and was sure she wasn't ready to have sex. She turned 16 at the end of the summer, and Mickey became more persistent that she sleep with him. When he became too insistent, she told him that she didn't want to see him anymore. 
But he continued to come back, pleading with her to see him, professing his love and undying devotion to her. She didn't love him, but told him she did, because it seemed cruel, she said, not to. Even so, she still tried to break things off. She hoped his parents would forbid her to see him. They didn't approve. But they did not, and she felt backed into a corner and continued to allow him to come around. When Francine still refused to have sex with him, Mickey began to talk about marriage. To put him off, she told him that she wanted to wait. If they still loved each other later, Francine said, then they could talk about marriage. He refused to take no for an answer. Somehow, Francine said, he made me feel guilty and responsible for him. Francine quit school that fall, dropping out at 16 like her two older siblings. She also got tired of resisting Mickey. He was so persistent and wore her down until she just gave in, losing her virginity in the backseat of a car. The first thing Mickey told her after was, now you don't have to marry me if you don't want to. Francine was horrified. She'd given him something she didn't want to give just to please him, and now she was his. This was how she was raised to believe things worked. She'd let him have her body, and now they were forever joined to one another. Only bad girls slept around, and more than anything, Francine wanted to be thought of as good. A good girl, a good daughter, a good wife, and someday a good mother. She told her parents now that she wanted to marry Mickey. They thought it was a bad idea, but didn't protest. Mickey's parents also didn't object. With a feeling of dread, she'd seen too many marriages that happened too fast and too young and turned out badly. But she tried to convince herself that it would work out. Mickey loved her, and she would be a good wife, and she was sure grow to love him too. Days before the wedding, Francine and Sharon were to attend a party with Mickey and Bill. When they got there, they saw some girls who were Mickey and Bill's former girlfriends going in. Francine and Sharon refused to attend the party and stayed in the car. The guys went in without them, leaving them to wait alone. Irritated and bored, Francine decided to drive away in Mickey's car, even though she had little driving experience. Mickey ran after her. She drove as far as Mickey's parents' house and parked it in front, running inside, giggling, to hide playfully from Mickey. When Mickey arrived to her shock, he grabbed her by the front of her blouse and placed his other hand around her throat in a tight grip. Don't you ever take my car, he said. She saw pure rage in his eyes. She burst into tears and apologized. She felt his anger was her fault. She knew how much his car meant to him, and she never should have driven it without his permission. He kissed her, and Francine put the incident out of her mind. Francine and Mickey were married on November 4, 1963. Before they even began their life together, Mickey quit his job. He decided he wanted a better job. Francine was now married to an 18-year-old, unemployed high school dropout. She was terrified, but felt it was too late to go back on her promise. Francine moved in with the Hughes family. Flossie in Berlin had six children, five boys and one girl. They were also caring for another child, Vicky, the daughter of one of Flossie's sisters who had died. Francine quickly realized that in the Hughes home, the boys were king. Flossie doted on the boys and required little or nothing of them. The girls were required to wait on the boys hand and foot. Mickey and his brothers were already known to the local sheriff's department. They had a reputation for being cocky troublemakers with no respect for the law. Mickey's first recorded arrest for disturbing the peace took place the previous year. The Hughes family was a tight-knit group and schoolmates, neighbors, and even the police knew that if you took on one of the Hughes boys, you took on the whole family. Immediately after they were married, Mickey began to complain jealously about Francine's clothes. They were too sexy and revealing, he said, and designed to attract the attention of other men. Francine tried to convince Mickey that she only wanted to look pretty for him. It was all to please her new husband, but he continued to criticize her outfits. He told her to wear her blouses hanging loose, not tucked in, to reveal her figure. One day when Mickey was out, Francine tucked in her blouse. Hearing him return, she quickly untucked it, but surveying her when he came in, he noticed it was wrinkled at the bottom. Francine admitted she had worn it tucked in. Without a word, Mickey pulled her upstairs into their room, pushed her on the bed, and pulled off her pants, ripping them to pieces while cursing at her. Shocked and embarrassed, since Francine knew Mickey's family must have heard everything, she began to sob. She believed she'd done nothing wrong, but quickly decided that if she'd just done as he'd said, 
he wouldn't have lost his temper. Mickey apologized later that night and told her he was jealous because he, quote, just loved her too much. Francine forgave him again. Mickey's father, Berlin, was a known cheapskate and a skinflint, berating the girls for using too much hot water when washing their hair. He and Flossie often argued about money, and having Mickey, who was still unemployed, and his new wife in their home became a source of friction. Meanwhile, Mickey was just hanging around the house, sometimes inviting friends over during the afternoons. A man Francine had never met before came by. Later that day, Mickey accused her of looking at him. At first confused, she said, Oh, I was just looking at his hands. He had such large hands. Before she knew what had happened, Mickey punched her, knocking her to the floor. I'll teach you to look at other men, you whore, he yelled and hit her again. Francine fought back. Hearing the noise from downstairs, Berlin came up yelling at Mickey to knock it off. Mickey turned on his father, cursing and telling him to mind his own business as Francine ran downstairs. Mickey and Berlin followed. Mickey now broke a chair and threatened his father. Flossie called the police. When they arrived, Mickey took a swing at an officer and was arrested. He was booked for assault and battery and released. Francine called her mother, asking to come home. Berlin drove her to Jackson. Within hours, Mickey showed up, apologizing to Francine. Francine was feeling guilty for being a burden to her mother and felt like her place was now with her husband. Hazel let Mickey stay, but told him he had to get a job and take care of his wife. He agreed. They stayed a couple of weeks with the Morans. Mickey was on his best behavior and soon found a job in a factory in Jackson. Francine found a small apartment in town, and they moved five blocks away from her parents. Francine settled into a routine of fixing up the apartment for the young couple, cooking and making sure everything was to Mickey's liking when he came home. Within a few weeks, when they were out together on a shopping trip, Mickey once again accused her of looking at another man. He hit Francine across the face while she was sitting beside him in the car. In the following months, Mickey continued to hit Francine regularly, jealously accusing her of some indiscretion or another. Francine became afraid to do anything, have anyone over, talk to friends, or even leave the house. Anything could set him off and cause him to hit her. In between these incidents, Francine continued to hope things would work out. Soon after a violent incident, Mickey would soon apologize, and there would be a period of normalcy where they would spend time together, making plans for the future, and Mickey would be sweet and loving. This is a classic cycle of violence, first described by psychologist Lenore Walker in 1979. Abusive relationships often follow a certain pattern or cycle that contains three parts. The tension-building phase, where tension begins to build over everyday problems like money, children, or jobs. Verbal abuse may begin, and the victim tries to appease the abuser by giving in or avoiding the abuse in some way. Next, the physical battering takes place. When it happens or how violent the incident is can be unpredictable. Finally, the honeymoon phase begins. In this phase, the abuser is apologetic and contrite. He or she may also try to minimize the incident of violence or blame the partner. They will exhibit kind and loving behavior for a period of time and try to convince the partner that the abuse will not happen again. The victim will want to believe this is true and will often forgive the abuser once again. This honeymoon phase lasts for a time until tension starts to build in the abuser and the cycle begins all over again. Over time, the period between cycles begins to speed up. The honeymoon phase lasts for a shorter period of time, if it occurs at all, and the abuse happens more frequently. Francine was allowed to take a part-time job as a waitress in a nearby restaurant to help bring in some money. When she'd return, Mickey would insist on a full accounting of her day, who she had seen, who she had talked to, and what she had said. She would drive Mickey to and from work now in order to have the car to get to work. But she fell asleep one day and awoke to find Mickey standing over her, yelling and asking her what she'd been doing. She missed picking him up, and he suspected her of being with another man. He tore through the house now, looking for Francine's lover. Finding no one, he still punished her for causing him to, quote, get worked up by deciding that she could no longer take the car and could not drive anywhere without him. Francine found herself trying to appease Mickey constantly now. I was willing to do anything to keep the peace, she said. I thought if I did, this phase would pass. Mickey would get over it and we could live a normal life. One day, Francine told Mickey she wanted to go to Jackson to visit her mom. 
Her friend and her husband were willing to give her a ride both ways. Mickey said no. You don't need to go to Jackson, he said, and you don't need to see your mom. Francine snapped. She couldn't stand Mickey's constant control over her life, even refusing to allow her to visit her own mother. She grabbed her coat and walked out of the door. Mickey grabbed her in front of their friends and pulled her back inside, slamming her to the floor. Her friends looked on in shock and soon left. Mickey beat the living hell out of her that day, she reports. This was the worst beating she'd had so far. Her face and body were covered in bruises. She had burst blood vessels in her eyes, causing them to be a bloodshot, bright red. Mickey wouldn't even look at her. She got up the next morning and cooked his breakfast, and he ate in silence. After he left for work, Francine called her brother to pick her up. She showed up embarrassed at her appearance at her mother's door. Soon after she arrived, Mickey appeared and began to bang on the door angrily, telling her to come out and talk to him. She told him to go away and leave her alone. He'd done enough damage. He left but continued to call the Moran's phone over and over. They'd take it off the hook for some time, but as soon as they put it back, the phone would begin ringing again. After several days of tension and frayed nerves, Francine's mother urged her to talk to him and resolve things one way or the other. Francine didn't want to talk to him, knowing he'd talk her into going home, which of course he did. On the drive home, Mickey told her he'd quit his job. He was too upset to go to work and had to give up the apartment. They moved back in with his parents. Francine soon found out that she was pregnant. She was hopeful that this would be a real start to their marriage. She'd hoped Mickey would be happy to be having a child with her and it would calm him down. Now that she was pregnant, he no longer seemed jealous, but was short-tempered nevertheless, criticizing her for every little thing. Her housekeeping, her cooking. He yelled a lot, but he didn't hit her while she was pregnant. In her seventh month of pregnancy, Mickey came home and announced that he couldn't do it. He didn't want to take care of a wife and a child, and that the marriage had been a mistake. What am I supposed to do? Francine cried. You can always go home to your mom, Mickey said. With no choice, Francine packed her things to move to Jackson. She soon found out Mickey was seeing other women. Feeling hurt and betrayed, she went to see him to tell him he needed to take care of his obligations. There was going to be doctor's bills and hospital bills soon, and he needed to pay her support. If you want to get anything out of me, he said, you're going to have to make me pay. Flossie, however, now urged her son not to desert his family. Family was everything in his mother's eyes, and this child would be a Hughes. Mickey began to talk to Francine again, and they decided to get back together. Francine was afraid to be alone with a child and no money, and didn't want to burden her own family. Mickey got a job at an airplane factory in Lansing, and they found an apartment to rent in town. The baby was born five days before Christmas, a girl they named Christy Marie. They began to live like a normal family, and Francine was once again hopeful. He'd not beaten her since she announced her pregnancy, but she felt like she was raising two children instead of one. She had to do absolutely everything for him, from dragging him out of bed in the morning to go to work, to cooking and cleaning for him and also cleaning up after his friends, along with caring for a newborn. Mickey's friends were over all weekend, drinking and smoking and playing music. Francine had been getting beers and emptying ashtrays all weekend. Finally exhausted and sick of the noise and trying to keep the baby from waking up, she finally spoke up. I'm sick of all this. I'm going to bed, she yelled. Mickey slapped her full force in front of everybody. Francine was humiliated. Mickey now began to beat Francine regularly again. He didn't care who was there or who might be watching, and no one spoke up for her. After all, most considered this to be a family affair. Friends and neighbors and Mickey's family just ignored the marks on Francine's face and body. When Christy was about six months old, Francine found out Mickey was cheating on her with other women. He was spending less time at home. He would also take his paychecks and spend most of it at the bars and wherever else he was going. Francine didn't have enough food and diapers and argued with Mickey. Furious, one day when he was leaving, she threw an ashtray at him that broke and cut his finger. He threw a vase at her and laughed and walked out the door. With his back to her, she threw a coffee cup at him that hit him in the back of the neck, cutting him. He went to his mother's and she took him to the hospital to have the cut stitched up. Flossie, in a rage, came to Francine's and yelled at her, You could have hurt him badly. You could have killed him. Francine yelled back, What about me? What do you think could happen to me when he's hitting me? His family defended Mickey while ignoring Francine's abuse. It would become a familiar pattern. 
When Christy was nine months old, Francine found out she was pregnant for the second time. Mickey was still cheating on her with other women. Her friends reported that he was bringing other women around when he was out without Francine. But she was afraid and wondered how she'd make it with two kids and no husband, especially knowing that he'd refused to pay any support in the past. So she swallowed her pride. Their second child was a son they named James, called Jimmy. Mickey got a job at an auto factory and was making a better wage. They moved to a small house right before Jimmy was born, and Mickey bought a 64 Malibu, a showy sports car. Mickey began coming home late. He'd never been a big drinker, but now he was coming home drunk more often. Francine had her hands full with two children in diapers. She was proud of her kids and kept them spotless and the house immaculate. She desperately wanted to be a good wife and mother and provide a good home for her children. A pattern also began to emerge that once things took on a normal routine, Mickey with a steady job, Francine settled into a routine of caring for the home and the children, Mickey would become bored. He'd quit his job for something better. This often required the young family to pack everything up and start over again, once to the Kansas City area for a construction job. Each move costs money, deposits on a new house or apartment, replacing furniture and other items that had to be left behind, and they often lived paycheck to paycheck. In between jobs, they always found themselves back at Flossie's house. Once there, Mickey would take his time finding a job while his wife and mother were required to wait on him. It was usually only at the urging of his father that he would find a job and start to contribute to his growing household again. When he was back in Dansville, Mickey would hang out at the Wood and Nickel Saloon, driving around town and causing trouble with his brothers. The brothers had obtained sawed-off shotguns after being threatened by some other men they were feuding with. Francine was in terror of their enemies coming and shooting up the house. One time, some men came by when Mickey was out and banged at the door for him to come out. Francine turned out the lights when she'd heard them coming and grabbed the kids and laid on the floor until long after they'd left. Francine didn't realize it, but she was starting to experience post-traumatic stress disorder from the unending unpredictability, Mickey's beatings, insecurity, and constant change. She was anxious almost all of the time, and her nerves were worn thin. She became afraid of many things, from being alone at night to going out alone, and began to isolate herself more at home. She rarely saw or spoke to family or friends outside of the Hughes family. Francine's bond to her children became even stronger. She felt now that they often only had each other for love and comfort. This is another common tactic of abusers isolating their victims so that they have no support system and become overly dependent on the abuser. Isolation can happen due to financial constraints or being embarrassed for others to know about the abuse or simply because the abuser moves them away geographically from family and friends. Mickey got into a fight in town and was thrown in jail. He was released in a few days. He told her he and his brothers were leaving to Florida and he would send for her and the kids when he found work. She asked for him to give her money for food before he left. He refused. They argued and Mickey got mad and Francine ran and hid behind the refrigerator. Mickey tipped it over and broke it when it crashed to the floor, narrowly missing crushing her. He then left. She had no money and the little food they had left spoiled in the broken refrigerator. Francine, to earn money for food and rent, took a job at a nursing home. She had no car, so she walked a few miles each day. Several weeks went by before she heard from Mickey. He had found no work in Florida and was back living with his parents in Dansville. Francine was beaten down, tired, hungry, and broke, and worried about the kids. She didn't argue when Mickey came to pack her up and take her back to his parents' house. Francine was terrified of becoming pregnant again. Things were hard enough, and had asked her doctor for birth control pills. He was a Catholic and refused to prescribe them to her. She had no money to visit another doctor, and Francine, not long after, found out she was pregnant for the third time. They continued to move as Mickey changed jobs and then lost them. He also began to beat her again, even during her third pregnancy. Her son, Dana, was born in August 1969. Bills continued to pile up, and creditors were looking for Mickey, even calling his job. As a result, he was let go again, and Mickey used up his unemployment checks on beer and gas to drive around. Yet Francine felt even more dependent on Mickey. He's having a hard time supporting us, she reasoned. How could I ever do it alone? Francine got pregnant for the fourth time in six years when Dana was nine months old. Money was almost non-existent. 
Francine didn't even have the basics like milk or soap, but she never thought to ask anyone for help. The kids would cry because they were hungry, Francine remembers, but Mickey refused to apply for welfare so she could feed them. The rules at that time required that the head of household, usually meaning the husband, had to make the application for aid. Francine went to the welfare office and told them, we're starving, but my husband refuses to come apply. The social worker told her unless she was divorced, they couldn't help her. Francine listed her plight. The rent was overdue. The landlord wanted them out. She was pregnant and didn't have a doctor. They were all hungry and dirty. She didn't even have money for soap. I'll do whatever I have to do. Just give me some aid. The caseworker sent her to the legal aid office where an older gentleman listened to her tell her story again. He was appalled at her situation and asked her if her husband ever hit her. Yes, she admitted. He handed her a form. I have the papers you need, Mrs. Hughes. The top of the form read, Decree of Divorce. Francine was shocked. What is this, she asked. You do want a divorce, don't you, he asked. She felt he was implying that she was crazy if she didn't. She was terrified at first and then excited about the prospect. Maybe it was all over, she thought. Maybe she could be free from Mickey and have some financial help to raise the kids. Maybe she could make it on her own, she thought. She signed the papers and was told she'd have to go to court in six months for the final decree. When she got home that night, she didn't tell Mickey what she had done. The next day, Francine, with the help of some friends, moved her few belongings to an apartment she had talked a landlord into renting her temporarily. She had a few dollars of emergency money she'd received from the welfare office. She planned to be out before Mickey came home. As she was pulling away, he arrived and followed her car. She pulled into a police station and ran in to ask for help. They held him off until she was able to drive away. Francine was now free, living alone in a tiny apartment with her three kids, and soon to give birth to a fourth. After years of being dependent on Mickey, she now fell into a depression. Flossie contacted her and pleaded with her to give Mickey another chance. The children needed their father, she said. Francine explained her desperation at being without food or money and how Mickey wouldn't help. Flossie assured her he wanted to work things out and wasn't angry. Francine agreed to talk to him. He was calm, but she realized nothing had changed. He wanted her to come back, but it was clear he was unwilling to do anything to help. She realized it would be pointless. Once Mickey understood she wasn't coming back, he threw it in her face that he was already living with another girl. Francine was more depressed than ever. She believed she'd ruined her life and that no other man would want to take on a woman with four children. She was lonely but refused offers from friends to take her out to meet someone new. She was afraid Mickey would find out. She still didn't feel free from him and was scared of what he would do. Soon Mickey was able to talk his way back into her life. She was lonely, depressed, and pregnant. She was also afraid that she'd be unable to take care of the kids financially on her own. Mickey used the excuse that he wanted to see the children, and before she knew it, he was living in the tiny apartment with them. Mickey came and went as he pleased, however, sometimes not showing up for days, sometimes in the company of his brother Donovan. Both of them were unemployed and would drink and carry on day or night. The landlord had been told he was renting to a single mother on welfare and didn't like this new situation. He soon kicked her out during one of Mickey's absences, and she and the children moved in with a friend. Francine found a house and was able to talk the owner into renting it to her. Soon after she moved in, Mickey showed up saying he was her husband and the father to the children, and he had a right to live there. Francine said he could visit the children, but couldn't live there because he'd get her kicked out. He refused to leave, and Francine was afraid to provoke a fight and gave in again. Her fourth child, a girl named Nicole, was born on a cold February day. Mickey was absent again and didn't attend the birth of his daughter. He showed up at the hospital in the middle of the night, drunk, and demanded to see Francine and the baby. The nurses denied him entry into the maternity ward, but allowed him to see the baby in the nursery window. Francine finally found that she no longer held any love for Mickey and didn't want to see him or have him around. She returned home with the baby. Mickey came and went as he pleased, saying she could get a thousand divorces. He had already been served the divorce papers, but she would always be his wife and these were his children. Francine, afraid of losing her lease if any violent scenes took place at her new home, didn't oppose him. Not long afterwards, Mickey was in a serious car accident. He ran a stop sign and hit another car. 
He was in a coma, and the doctors weren't sure he would survive. Francine was called by Mickey's family and went to be by his side. It never occurred to her to turn her back on Mickey or the family when they needed her. Mickey regained consciousness a few hours after surgery, and the first person he called for was Francine. He only wanted her help and became very agitated whenever she was not by his side, even for a moment. She would be at the hospital for 24-hour shifts. The family said they would all take turns. Francine noticed that his parents and siblings would spell each other after a few hours, but she was the only one left alone with Mickey for an entire 24-hour shift. Even when she wasn't supposed to be at the hospital, they would call her, since Mickey now seemed fixated and dependent on Francine. Mickey was scheduled to be released from the hospital after a month, and Flossie had talked Francine into renting a duplex that was available next door to their own home, so that she would be close by to help Mickey. No one asked her if she'd be willing to continue caring for him. They just assumed it, and Francine felt obligated to help and didn't protest. She never returned to her house and the freedom she'd hoped it would provide from Mickey and his abuse. The doctors said Mickey's physical recovery had been miraculous, but they were concerned about his psychological state. They saw how dependent he was becoming on the nurturing and the attention he received from Francine and his mother. Don't baby him, they advised. He'll be dependent as long as you allow it. But his mother and father and siblings would cater to his every demand. When Francine didn't, Flossie would berate her for being cruel and not helping him enough. Francine felt completely trapped now. She didn't want to be responsible for Mickey and his care, which she increasingly was. But, she thought, what would the kids think of me if I walked away and left their father? When Mickey's final cast was taken off after two months, he finally began to leave the house. Glad to be free of Mickey even for a few hours, it soon became apparent that things would now be even worse. He'd leave the house only to go to the bar to drink. He would return not only drunk, but angry and mean as well. He asked Francine to marry him again. She couldn't bring herself to agree. When she said no, he hit her for the first time since the accident. She now more frequently saw the danger signs that signaled a beating. His eyes would glitter, he'd clench his teeth, the muscles in his jaws would twitch. She'd almost had a year of living without the constant fear, and now it was back. But now it seemed much worse. Later, she'd wonder if something had happened to him as a result of the car accident that had made him so crazy. Did something happen to affect his brain that made his violent rages worse? Or was it the fact that he was more helpless due to his physical deterioration that caused him to use violence to feel in control? She didn't know. All she did know was that now her real hell began. One night, Mickey came home drunk and began to criticize what she was making for dinner. Francine realized that he was working himself up into a rage and tried to placate him. I'll feed this to the kids and fix you something else, she offered. Damn right you will, he said. Go get ten divorces. It won't do you any fucking good. He kept following her breathing hard. I wouldn't marry a fat-ass fucking bitch like you. Not for a million bucks. How do you like that, whore? He began to punch her. Christy was crying in the doorway, and Francine told her to run next door to get Flossie. Moments later, Mickey's parents arrived. They tried to pull him away, and he threw Berlin against a wall, and then struck his mother across the face. Francine ran to her in-law's house to call the police when Mickey came through the door. He dragged her outside into the yard. He was pummeling her when the police car pulled up. The deputies approached, and he swung at them. They had to hold him down on the ground as he continued to fight them. Flossie came running out, yelling at the deputies to get off of her son. He was sick, and they were hurting him, she said. They arrested him and took him away to be checked out at the hospital. Later, it was determined that he was unhurt. Prior to 1984, police were unable to arrest a person for domestic violence unless it had been committed in their presence, even if the victim was clearly injured. Even if the police witnessed the violence, officers would often decline to arrest men for domestic violence. Officers reported that responding to domestic violence calls were the most dangerous calls they faced and much more prevalent than any other kind of assault. After sometimes putting their lives in danger, they complained, the wife would often decide not to press charges. This was true for a variety of reasons. Fear of retaliation by the abuser, loss of income due to a partner being in jail, guilt, or even love. In this instance and others to follow, the officers could arrest Mickey since they'd witnessed him hitting Francine. But he was arrested because he had assaulted a police officer, not because he had assaulted his wife. 
assault on an officer was taken much more seriously. Even so, charges were not filed this time, and Mickey was released from the hospital the next morning. When he returned home, he hugged Francine. She pushed him away and told him if he beat her again, she would leave. Angrily, he answered, where do you think you're going to go to? He continued to beat Francine. Flossie's advice for Francine was to make allowances for Mickey and not make him angry. The beatings escalated in frequency and intensity. One day, Mickey came home to find Francine gone. She had gone down the street to visit a neighbor. She heard him cursing in the street and rushed home. What were you doing there, he demanded. You have no business going out. You don't go to nobody's house unless I tell you. Francine said he was acting crazy as he followed her into the house and seemed completely out of control. He knocked her to the floor and began kicking her over and over while she screamed in pain. The children witnessed it and were screaming and crying. Francine ran next door to Flossie's and hid. Soon the police drove up. What's the problem, they asked Mickey. There's no problem, Mickey replied. But if I find my wife, there will be. If I find her, I'll break her fucking neck. The police couldn't even respond to threats of violence against someone then, and Mickey knew it. The officers then went to talk to Francine, who told them what had happened. Again, they hadn't witnessed it, so they couldn't arrest Mickey. They told Francine that she could go to the office of the prosecutor in Lansing and swear out a complaint. Mickey would be charged with a misdemeanor and could be put on probation or sentenced to 30 days. Most abused wives knew at this time that at most their abusers would receive a slap on the wrist, if anything at all, and then would seek revenge and the abuse would get worse or even become deadly. Not long before this latest attack, Francine found out about a program to help low-income families buy homes. She began to search for a home for her and her children that she could afford. Flossie found out that the house next door to hers was for sale for $16,000 and talked Francine into buying it. It was just a few weeks before the purchase was finalized that Mickey began the worst attacks on Francine. She was very apprehensive about tying herself so closely to Mickey and his family now, but felt it was too late to back out, so she moved into the new house. Mickey was now classified as totally disabled due to his accident and was receiving Social Security benefits. He no longer worked and spent his checks at the bar and for whatever else he wanted, never helping Francine to provide for the kids. During another attack on Francine, Berlin tried to intervene when Mickey grabbed a knife. Berlin held him back. The deputies soon arrived. Mickey fought them and was once again arrested. Francine told them he had chased her with a knife. The officer told Berlin, if I ever come out here and see your son with a knife trying to stab someone, I'll have to shoot him. Berlin replied, I'll kill any son of a bitch that kills a son of mine. Francine felt that Mickey's rages weren't different than before the accident, just more frequent and intensified. He seemed totally crazy with rage when he got going. She began to think that he might need to be committed to a mental hospital. His parents had seen him completely lose control and seemed to be out of his mind so she approached them for their help while Mickey was in jail. She knew time was of the essence before he was released. She tried to convince them to have him seen by a psychiatrist and possibly hospitalized. Surprisingly, Flossie agreed. I'd rather have him in the hospital than in jail, she said. When he's mad, he doesn't know what he's doing. He ought to see a doctor and get help before he hurts somebody real bad. Berlin was furious. He told Flossie that he was leaving. He wouldn't stand for such a thing. He left the house without another word. He was gone for three weeks. Flossie was devastated, taking to her bed and not speaking to anyone. Mickey was released and came home. When Berlin finally returned, the subject was never brought up again. Mickey's drinking increased, and now in addition to the violence against Francine, he also lashed out at the kids and added an element of cruelty. The children would be locked out of the house at Mickey's whims or sent to the room without food, and he wouldn't even let them come out to use the bathroom. He would slap both Jimmy and Dana across the face. After calling Francine horrible names all day and then beating her, he'd want sex. To refuse him meant more beatings, so Francine would relent, disgusted and hating herself. Francine admits that often during these times, she'd wish she were dead. Only the thought of the children being left with either Mickey or his family kept her from acting on these thoughts. She thought more and more about leaving, but as if Mickey read her mind, he would say to her over and over, Don't think you can leave me, you bitch. Not ever. You ain't ever going to get rid of me. I'll find you wherever you go, and when I do, it won't be pretty. I'll kill you inch by inch. Sometimes he'd add, 
Don't think I wouldn't kill you. I don't give a shit what happens to me. I got nothing to lose. Francine felt she herself was going crazy. Her anxiety was off the charts and her depression worsened. She felt completely trapped and hopeless, but forced herself to go on for the sake of the children. Her biggest regret was that she had left school before receiving her high school diploma. She saw an ad for free adult education courses for high school dropouts. She could earn her general equivalency diploma by completing a course. She talked Mickey into it one day when he was sober and in a good mood by saying it would help her to get a job that paid well. He said she could do it, but she was too dumb and that she probably wouldn't be able to finish the course. Undeterred, Francine enrolled. Once in the classroom, she experienced it as a place of peace and sanity. She was also pleasantly surprised to realize that the schoolwork came easily to her. She finished the course and began looking for work. Without the break of being away from Mickey while in school, her anxiety symptoms came back worse than ever. Her heart would race and she would feel a shortness of breath. She went to see a doctor. Francine, as always, shared her predicament with another professional without receiving much help. Why don't you throw the guy out, the doctor asked, or take the kids and get away? He wrote her prescription for tranquilizers, and that was all. At every turn when Francine reached out for help, she was given the runaround. The police came out over and over and could do nothing. She tried to approach the welfare office and tell them that her ex-husband wouldn't leave the house. There was nothing they could do, they said. And because she was receiving aid, they told her, if he was living there, she could be charged with fraud. She was told by officers to go to the probate office and see if they could help. He's crazy, and I think he's going to kill me, she pleaded. Can't you get him committed? The woman at the probate office asked if he drank. Yes, Francine said. He's drunk every day. We don't handle alcoholics, she said. You'll have to go through other programs for that. They told her to see a lawyer. She told them she couldn't afford one. There's nothing we can do, they said. Sometimes women have to leave the state to get away from their husbands. Maybe you could do that. Mickey wasn't even legally her husband anymore, but that didn't seem to matter to anyone at all. She couldn't even get him out of her home. Every door had been slammed in my face, Francine says. I was worse off than before. Now I knew I couldn't get any help from the courts or the hospitals. I was up against a blank wall. There was a brief change when Francine stayed away for a period of time with her mother. Mickey had come and taken the children, but even so, Francine didn't return. She was afraid to leave the children with Mickey and his family, but couldn't think what else to do. Glossy finally called her and said Mickey was a changed man. He was attending church with them and going to Alcoholics Anonymous. Francine visited and saw that Mickey seemed calmer and more remorseful than she'd seen him in years. She agreed to come back, mostly for the children's sake. They had a brief time of calm. The family attended church, and Mickey stayed sober and continued attending AA meetings. He professed his love for Francine again, and she thought maybe some peace might return. She still didn't feel she loved him, but she felt grateful for this time of relative calm. Mickey began drinking again without warning. He returned home drunk one day and stood over her grinning. No goddamn woman is going to tell me I can't take a drink, he said. He then hit her across the face and dragged her out of bed. Dragging her into the kitchen, he held a knife to her throat. He seemed completely insane. Finally, he threw the knife down, saying, Get out of here before I cut your throat. Francine had filled out a grant application for adult education and been approved. If she enrolled in school, she would receive money to cover her tuition and a small amount for books and transportation. She decided she'd like to attend Lansing Business College. She thought she could sell Mickey on the idea of free government money. If she didn't go, she wouldn't receive the money, she explained. Once again, he told her she was too stupid to finish, but to go ahead. She enrolled in Lansing Business College in September of 1976. She soon found that she loved the college courses and even had a few friends at the school. They would sit together and have coffee between classes, and she felt more normal than she had since she left school at 16. She, of course, didn't tell them what was going on at home. But later, her fellow students would say that, of course, they saw the marks on her and guessed what was happening. She had to be very careful at home, though. Mickey hated to see her study or even leave her books out where he'd see them, and it would set him off. She often had to wait until late at night when he was asleep to study and then get up early in the morning to get the kids off to school and head to her classes. 
but she felt it was worth it. Mickey would beat Francine once or twice per week now. He'd find any excuse to get angry. It seemed he was often just playing a cruel game with her. Sometimes he would strike her just because she flinched as he circled around her menacingly. In October, he almost killed her. He began to choke her, this time holding her throat longer than usual until she began to black out. She thought, this is it. He's finally going to kill me this time. A moment later, he let her go. Now you bitch, get out, he yelled as she struggled for air. She ran out, not knowing where she was going. She just got in her car and began to drive. Within a couple of miles, she saw Mickey's car in her rearview mirror. He tried to force her off the road. She saw a police car in a shopping center parking lot and squealed in with Mickey close behind. Mickey leaped out and tried to get to Francine. The officer intercepted him and began to put the cuffs on him while he screamed that he wanted to get his hands around Francine's throat. Francine now went to swear out a complaint at the prosecutor's office in Lansing. Officers had seen him try to run her off the road and heard his threats. She thought that now they could charge him with attempted murder. She spoke with an assistant prosecutor who didn't seem to react much to her story. He looked at Mickey's record. I see he's on probation, he said, so he'll be automatically picked up. That should be enough. Can't I make a complaint for attempted murder, she asked. I'm going to let probation handle it, he said. He told her to call back later. He would check with the police officer who arrested him. When she called, he said that unfortunately Mickey had already been released. He'd talk with probation, but arrests for parole violations weren't a priority item. Meanwhile, Francine stayed away from home with Mickey's stepsister, hoping he'd be arrested soon. She waited for days. Nothing happened, and she was running out of money and needed to get home. Mickey called, and he was sober. He told her to come home. He wasn't drinking, and she didn't need to be afraid. Out of options, she returned home. The house was exactly as she'd left it. Furniture overturned, broken dishes, and a mess everywhere. Mickey was sitting in a corner drinking. Welcome home, you dumb bitch, he said. You've got a lot of housework to do. Three weeks after she returned... Mickey was arrested for the parole violation and sentenced to 45 days in jail. He served only eight due to the overcrowded conditions at the jail. Francine was still going to her classes, but found everything harder to keep up with. The late night studying, the early mornings to get her chores done, and then coming home in the afternoons to prepare dinner. Francine also had full responsibility for the house and the kids, while still cooking and cleaning for Mickey, as well as being his punching bag whenever the mood struck. It all was taking its toll. She vowed not to give up, though. School was her only refuge, and she felt it was the only thing that held any hope for a future for her and her kids. On March 9, 1977, Francine's day began as usual. She got up at 5 a.m. and got ready for the day. She saw that the older kids got off to school and then dropped Nikki, the youngest, at the sitter on the way to the business college. She had a good day at school, and at the end of her last class, one of the other students asked her if she could catch a ride with her. Francine agreed and dropped her off on her way home. As a result, she arrived about 10 minutes later than usual at home, about 1.40 p.m. Mickey was home and already very drunk. He began to question her about why she was so late. He was starting to pick on her for every little thing. She saw there was nothing to make for dinner, so she told him she needed to go into town for groceries. Mickey began to tell her what she should get and what he didn't want. I don't want you to buy any of your goddamn greasy food, he yelled. It's your greasy food that makes me sick. Francine piled the kids in the car for the trip to the market. She decided to make something simple. The kids were already hungry. Mickey had kicked them outside when they got home from school at noon. It had been an early release day, so they hadn't had lunch. They opted for TV dinners, something Francine rarely bought and the kids saw as a special treat. Francine agreed, thinking it would be quick and easy to get them fed. She still had a lot of homework to get to and laundry that needed to be done. When they returned, Mickey began pulling each item out of the grocery bag and questioning her about each purchase. What'd you buy that for? How much was that? Then he pulled out the TV dinners. You fucking no good lazy ass bitch. You know I don't like TV dinners, he yelled. If you ain't got no more sense than to bring that garbage home, you ain't gonna fix it. I don't even want to smell that shit cooking. The kids were hungry and when Nikki heard her father, she began to cry. Francine could see the warning signs and was trying to figure out how to get the kids fed without setting him off. Then Mickey brought up another subject to bitch about. And there's another thing you ain't gonna do, he said. You ain't gonna go to school no more. 
You're going to stay home and do what a wife is supposed to do. He walked out of the kitchen. Something rose up in Francine. No, she thought. I'm not going to quit. It's the only thing I've got. She put the TV dinners in the oven. Sometimes he would cause a ruckus about something or other and forget about it ten minutes later. This time he didn't. He came in and turned off the oven. I told you you weren't fixing TV dinners, he yelled. Francine reasoned with him to just let her fix them for the kids. She said she'd fix something else for him. She turned the oven back on. A few minutes later, he ran in the kitchen and turned the oven off and hit her. He then began to scream at her that she wasn't going back to school. This time, Francine yelled back, I'm not quitting school. You can't make me. He seemed to be thinking for a minute and then told her she had to turn her car back in to the car dealer. He knew if she had no car, there was no way for her to get to school. He threatened if she didn't, he'd take a sledgehammer to it. She knew he'd do it. She picked up the phone and pretended to call the car dealership, telling them she wanted to turn in the car. She then told Mickey that they'd said she couldn't do that until the next month. If she didn't make the payment, then they would repo it, but not before. Mickey said nothing, but she knew he was thinking of his next move. What would he do now to pick at her, taunt her, control her, torture her? He leaped up and picked up her book bag, emptying the books and papers in a heap. He then picked up a textbook and struggled to rip it apart. He tore out the pages in her notebooks and crumpled them. Francine looked on in dismay, weeks of work being destroyed. But she dared not utter a word. He took her car keys, checkbook, and money and put them in his pocket. He smiled at her. Now, bitch, bet you don't go to school. He then grabbed her by the throat and threw her down with the books. He told her to pick them up and take them out to the burn barrel while he continued to hit her and threatened to break her neck. She felt pain, anger, and humiliation all at once. She tasted blood in her mouth and her lip was swollen. She gathered up the ruined books and papers and, feeling numb, carried them out to the burn barrel. She watched all her hard work go up literally in flames. Mickey called her into the living room. Now are you going to go to school? He taunted her. Yes, Mickey, Francine said. I'm still going to go to school. The fight continued. Mickey wouldn't let the kids inside. It was cold and they were hungry. Francine asked him if she could just feed them and talk about school later. He refused, still complaining about the TV dinners and wouldn't allow her to prepare them for the kids. He wanted her to say she wouldn't go to school anymore, but she couldn't do it. If I say it, she thought, that will be it. Mickey will win again and I'll never go back. Finally, he completely lost his temper and shoved her on the ground and began punching her. He finally let her get up and she went to wash her face before returning to the kitchen. On her way back, he pinned her against the door. I'm going to kill you this time, you dirty whore, he said. Francine yelled to Christy to call the police and the girl ran to Flossie's. Knowing the police were being called, Mickey let her go and sat down in the living room. When they arrived, it was the same story. Mickey wasn't seen hitting her. He knew better now. Francine told them he'd been hitting her, and when the cop asked Mickey if it was true, he admitted it, knowing it didn't matter. He even told the cops he was going to kill her. You're going to kill her, they asked? Where do you think that will get you? Francine knew it didn't matter. Mickey didn't care if he was arrested for murder, as long as she were dead. The cops asked her if she wanted to leave, but she knew he'd follow her wherever she went, so there was no point. When they left, she thought Mickey might fall asleep now. He'd continue to drink, so maybe he'd worn himself out, she thought. She told the kids to be quiet, and they sat down to eat. Just as they started dinner, Mickey returned to the kitchen. He got another beer, and then, without warning, backhanded Francine out of her chair. He then knocked all of the food off the table and ordered the kids to get upstairs. If you think things were bad before, he told Francine, they're going to be worse now. I'm going to make your life so much more miserable. Francine couldn't figure out how that would be possible. Grabbing her by the hair, he pushed her face down on the floor, rubbing it into the food on the floor. Now clean it up, he yelled. After she cleaned up the mess and put it in the trash can, he picked up the trash and dumped it back on the floor. Now clean it up again, he said. She sobbed, trying to pick up the mess yet again. He grabbed the spoiled food and garbage and smashed it into her face and hair. He began to pummel her again. Do you still think you're going to go to school? No, Mickey, she answered. I'm not going to go to school. Francine felt broken, but Mickey still made her repeat it three times. 
Afterwards, he told her to finish cleaning up the mess and fix him something to eat. The children were calling from upstairs, asking her if she was okay. He yelled at them to shut their mouths and stay in their rooms. Francine thought, you can't even protect your children. He can do anything he wants, and he'll get away with it. Mickey ate upstairs in the bedroom. When he was done, he called to Francine. She went up to the room, and he was laying in the bed with his pants unzipped. How about a little, he grinned at her. Francine felt sick, but knew from the past if she refused him, the beatings would start all over again. She was trapped. She knew he'd fall asleep afterwards, and she could go to the kids. Mickey fell asleep, and she let the kids out of their rooms. They didn't want anything to eat now. Francine, Christy, Jimmy, and Nicole sat in the living room quietly. Dana was gone to visit a friend. Francine sat and thought about her life, about her kids' lives, how no matter what she tried to do, Mickey knocked it down. Things kept getting worse, and she could see no hope left. She thought she should just take the kids and leave, and when he woke up, they'd be gone. She didn't care now about anything but being free. She'd leave her house and everything else behind and just go. She had nothing left, so what was stopping her? She tiptoed upstairs and retrieved her car keys and her money from Mickey's pants pocket. But Dana wasn't home yet, and she'd have to wait for him to return first. After minutes passed, she began to get nervous. She then began to think of all the times she'd tried to leave, but she'd always ended up having to come back. But she thought, I can't come back if there's nothing to come back to. A new thought occurred to her. I'll burn the house down, she thought. What about Mickey was her next thought. Yes, I'll burn him too. Then everything will be gone. She felt elated at this thought. Nothing else occurred to her in that moment, she later said. She just thought of being rid of this life. Francine went down to the cellar. There she found a gas can that they used to fill the lawnmower. She carried it into the house and set it by the back door before telling the kids to get their coats and shoes and wait for her in the car. She had already told them they were leaving and wouldn't be coming back. Francine felt clear-headed as she walked up the stairs with the gas can. She says she doesn't remember seeing Mickey sleeping in the bed, but knows he must have been there. She poured gasoline around the bed and backed out of the door. Just outside the bedroom, she lit the match, throwing it into the room. Only then it struck her. My God, what are you doing, she thought as the flames began to roar. A rush of air slammed the door closed with a tremendous force. I ran for my life, she says. In shock, she ran to the car. The kids were looking back at the house. Now flames were shooting out of the window, and they were yelling and screaming. Francine thought, I've got to get help. But she couldn't think clearly what to do until Christy yelled at her to go to the police. She drove to the Ingham County Jail. There was a gate with a guard post in front. She stopped. She heard herself scream and then say, I did it. Fire trucks were dispatched to the house on Grove Street, but the flames were so hot it took several attempts before they could make any progress. Once they did, they found Mickey in the living room lying dead on the floor. Later, it would be determined he died of smoke inhalation. His body was also badly burned. His family arrived right after the firefighters. Flossie tried to break away from the men holding her back to dash into the house. Berlin and Donovan were also there when Mickey's body was brought out. They were in shock. Back at the police station, Francine was sobbing and crying over and over, I did it. Oh my God, is he dead? She was read a copy of her Miranda rights and signed a copy. Now the homicide detectives asked her if she was ready to make her statement. What do you mean, she said, I've already told you. No, I mean in writing. We need you to write your statement. At that time, Francine said she'd better talk to a lawyer. Francine's case was assigned to attorney Arjun Gradness. After hearing Francine's story, he believed it was the worst case of abuse he'd ever encountered. He knew they couldn't plead not guilty. She'd already admitted to the crime several times. He wanted her to plead self-defense. Surely he believed she had done the only thing she could think of to do to save her life but self-defense had always been defined as an act to escape immediate danger. Francine had waited nearly three hours between the last beating and when she struck the match. The prosecutors were charging Francine with first-degree murder. Gradness thought the charge was excessive and ridiculous, and at first wanted to plead to manslaughter. The prosecutors refused. 
After talking with deputies, neighbors, and others who knew Mickey Hughes and could verify Francine's story, her attorney had her examined by psychiatrists. He then decided to ask the jury to consider her not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. Gradness had Francine's friends, neighbors, family members, and her two oldest children testify to the horror of abuse Francine had lived in for over 12 years. Everybody knew about it, he realized. From family and friends to law enforcement and social services, and nobody had helped her. Flossie was made to testify and flatly refused to admit that Mickey had ever hit Francine or ever been violent with any other family members. She came across as angry and seeking revenge against her daughter-in-law for the death of her son but her testimony was quickly shot down by police reports and neighbors' eyewitness statements to the contrary. But the most powerful testimony came from Francine herself. On the stand, she detailed her life of terror and abuse at the hands of Mickey Hughes. Jurors were convinced that Francine felt completely trapped, hopeless, and terrified for her life and her kids' lives on a daily basis. They returned a verdict of not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. Without the temporary designation... Francine could have spent many years, even the rest of her life, committed to a mental facility. But it was determined her break with sanity happened that day, after the beating and the feeling of complete loss of control, after Mickey forced her to say she would quit school, and ended soon after she struck the match, regaining clarity of mind and turning herself into the police. She'd spent 12 years in hell and eight months in jail, and now she was free. There was controversy over the acquittal of Francine Hughes for setting her husband on fire and taking his life, as you might imagine. Feminists hailed her as a hero and abused women felt empowered by her actions. But others, including Mickey's family, thought she had gotten away with murder. They threatened her life, writing her in jail while she was awaiting trial, sending a note that just said, you're next. Law enforcement officers warned that women might now take the law into their own hands and there would be a rash of wives killing husbands. However, this didn't happen. Other changes did happen, but it would still take some time for domestic violence victims to get heard and get the help they needed. In the 1970s, grassroots organizing efforts had already begun to spring up against domestic violence. In 1972, the first battered women's shelter was opened in Phoenix, Arizona, and the first Take Back the Night event was held to shine a light on sexual assault and domestic violence. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence formed in 1978. After Francine Hughes's case made the news across the country, people began to rally in earnest for legislative change. The first Domestic Violence Act was proposed, but failed to pass the House. By 1981, there were over 500 shelters across the U.S. for victims of domestic violence. They provided a safe place for women to stay, as well as services to help with restraining orders, financial aid, and other social services. In the 1990s, the no-drop policy began in some jurisdictions. These policies put the prosecutors, not the victims, in charge of moving forward on abuse cases. Victims could not arbitrarily drop charges against their abusers. The complainant was now the state or the jurisdiction who had made the arrest. Another policy that helped domestic violence victims tremendously was a change in police procedure in abuse cases. Officers no longer had to see the abuse happening, but if they had a witness statement or simply saw marks or injuries on a victim, the suspected abuser could be arrested and charged. In 1993, healthcare practitioners in California began to be required to report suspected domestic violence to police when treating patients for injuries. Finally, in 1994, the Violence Against Women Act was signed into law by President Bill Clinton. The bill, co-written by Senator Joe Biden and Congressperson Barbara Boxer, listed its objectives as raising public awareness for domestic violence, changing attitudes about it, providing resources to the victims, and improving the response of the criminal justice system to domestic violence. Twelve days after her acquittal and after she'd been cleared by psychiatrists, Francine and her children went home to live with her mother in Jackson, Michigan. She'd been dependent on Mickey for so long, and now she transferred that dependence for a time to her mother. Afraid to go out alone, she would panic when her mother was not in sight for a few minutes. She had been away from her children for nine months, not allowing them to visit her in jail. She thought it would be too traumatic. 
Now she had to rebuild relationships with 12-year-old Christy, 10-year-old Jimmy, 8-year-old Dana, and 6-year-old Nicole. It was rough at first. Her case had been so highly publicized that everyone knew who they were and the children would be teased and harassed. None of them expressed sadness over their father's death. Later, as a teen, Christy would say, I spit on his grave. He was a rotten son of a bitch. Francine's story was told in a book by Faith McNulty titled The Burning Bed, published in 1980. With an $11,000 advance from its publishing, she put a down payment on a house in the suburbs of Jackson. She admits she kind of lost her way for a time, drinking and doing drugs. She then met a man named Robert Wilson, a musician who'd served time for armed robbery. They married not long after they met. The kids were dealing with their own demons. Christy was rebellious and didn't like her new stepfather setting rules for her. Jimmy had anger issues and was in counseling. At 16, Christy moved out of the house and refused to move to Tennessee with her family. Wilson was from Tennessee, and they bought a 15-acre plot of land in Shelbyville, where they built a house. Francine went back to school and became a licensed practical nurse. Later, Nicole would accuse Wilson of trying to molest her. Wilson denied this, saying that Nicole was looking for an excuse to go back to Michigan and run wild with her big sister. Francine would follow Nicole back to Michigan and lease a place for her and the girls while Wilson stayed in Tennessee with the boys. They remained married but lived in separate states. Dana considers Wilson his father. Christy would later report that her mother beat her when she could not control her behavior. The movie The Burning Bed was released in 1984. Francine received $8,000 for her share of the movie rights. Mickey's mother Flossie refused to watch it, calling it a pack of lies. She said she watched the Country Music Awards instead. Flossie died in 2004 at the age of 82. Donovan Hughes, Mickey's youngest brother, committed suicide in 1979 at the age of 28. His family says it was on account of Mickey's death. He couldn't get over it, they said. Berlin Hughes, Mickey's father, also committed suicide several years later at the age of 64. If you or someone you know is being abused, you can get help. In the U.S., you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. In the UK, you can log on to victimsupport.org.uk. And in Australia, contact the Domestic Violence Resource Centre at dvrcv.org.au. Links to these resources will be provided on the show page. That concludes this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. To give feedback or suggest show topics, you can find me on Facebook at Once Upon a Crime Pod and on Twitter and Instagram at Upon a Crime. Until next time, be good to one another. Thank you.